Um, so I am from the Innovation Exchange, which is a team in, um, in IBM in Dublin. So we are a group of research engineers, PhDs, uh, sorry, and uh, developers, basically working together in a few uh, quite interesting projects, ranging from healthcare, uh, telecoms, uh, and obviously uh, myself in the automotive space. So today I'm here to talk about how the cloud can actually support the automated vehicles. Now I chose particularly the word automated, and thanks to Andy who made the point also that um, there, is, there is a clear distinction what automated actually means and what autonomous actually means. So just to go a bit on the uh, technical uh, details of the definition, the, the key differentiator between the automated vehicles and the autonomous vehicles is whether a human driver must be present in the vehicle. So again, well pointed even, even yesterday, but also today, uh, we are far away from having fully autonomous vehicles. So technically maybe not, but we are quite there. But, uh, but in more like a limited scenario, um, so where road infrastructure in, is controlled and, and the environment is controlled, yes, autonomous vehicles can exist. But legally speaking, we are still going to look at automated vehicles for quite a while. Now, um, today I'm going to make my presentation about a particular automated case um, where the driver is still in the loop but at some point they can disengage with the actual driving uh, process. Uh, however, so then the car can take over the driving um, uh, feature, the, the, the driving tasks. However, at some point, the automated system might have to give the control back to the driver. The question is, how do we actually know if the driver is in a position to take control back? Um, so that's a bit of the context of self-driving and, and such. And what we believe is that the, um, the key enabler, the key enabler uh, part of the automated and even the autonomous world is actually the connected uh, application. Sorry, the connected vehicle is the number one connected application in this space. Um, I, I captured a few, a few points from one of our uh, reports. So we have a report called uh, um, Automotive 2025, 20, in which we captured a few uh, statistics. So there were around 200 million cars which were actually connected in some sorts and sharing some, some types of data uh, with other vehicles or with the, with the cloud. Um, and we have estimated roughly about 350 megabytes of data would be uh, created every second in the vehicle. Yesterday we saw someone pointed out it's actually around 500 megabytes. Now, it's still a lot of data regardless. And the problem is this data, of course, needs to be live, uh, needs to be real time analyzed for it to be useful in the vehicle. But after a few seconds, that's useless information. But you still end up with a lot of data. You, you may have to retain it for uh, uh, audit purposes and such. Uh, However, a subset of that data can be shared with other vehicles, and a subset of the data can be shared with the cloud. But the whole data with, we saw yesterday, 5G, is almost there. 5G can push a lot of data around, but we, there, is, there, are, there are doubts whether this volume of data can be actually streamed always live, and whether the external up services, cloud, for example, can actually provide real-time support because the connectivity is not as reliable. We've seen yesterday was a presentation. Someone was saying that to have the five nines um, reliability, we need around six, seven interfaces for redundancy purposes. That's quite, <laughs> quite a connectivity requirement. So let me draw your attention to one of the projects. Actually, we have two projects that we are working on, uh, both hash 2020. One of, one of which, which is highly relevant today, is VIDAS. So VIDAS from Vision Inspired Driving Assistance Systems. So what we actually uh, 
proposed to do was create a consortium. So we have 16 partners in this consortium, and we have ranging from OEMs, tier one, tier two suppliers. Uh, we have uh, human machine interface uh, experts. Uh, we have uh, computer vision experts and also insurance companies and legal people. So it's good to have those around. Technology can go quite, quite a long way and they can always come back and say, oh, this, might, this, this might have to be shelved for a while. Legally, <coughs> legally we're not there. Sorry, I don't know what I did. Um, anyway, in Vidas, we're looking at, uh, uh, actually in the previous presentation, we saw the, the six, the, actually the five li different levels of automation. Uh, but we're mainly looking at the crossing between the partial, partial automation and the uh, like conditional automation. So level two and level three, respectively. In level two, the driver mainly is involved in all the tasks, but as I pointed out in, uh, earlier, in level three, the driver actually can perform other tasks than driving and controlled, controlled, but still they can perform other tasks. So they are not actually actively 100% involved in the driving process. So while the crossing between level two and level three is quite simple, we've seen the, the, the car thinks it's capable of driving the, the vehicle, it knows from the localization, yeah, I know, I, I know the map, I know the whereabouts, I can actually drive this car, would you let me? So you press the button, yes, automation takes over. The crossing back is the problem. How, how do you know whether the driver is actually aware of speed limits, is aware of the situation ahead, did they check the mirrors, did they check all the systems? So the crossing back is actually the, the uh, focus of, it will come, come across in a few um, instances. Um, to give you kind of an architecture view of how things couple together in terms of um, um, moving data from the cloud, from, sorry, from the vehicle to the cloud and backwards, uh, there are actually two cases. One is covered in Vidas, and the bottom one is covered actually by a different H220 project. And uh, the two cases revolve around big data. So as I pointed out, there's a lot of big data created by the sensors, cameras, and the vehicles. But there are also uh, things called the little big data. So there is small pieces of information, but from a huge re fleet of cars and a huge, even more range of sensors. So the top, the top uh, um, uh, diagram, the platform as a service that we have in our IBM cloud actually provides a me the means for uh, stakeholders to push their little big data into the cloud uh, through, for example, we have our Watson IT offering, uh, which Basically, provided you have internet connectivity, you have a client in the vehicle, you provide the client with the little big data you have from various sensors, and up it goes into the cloud. Now, in the cloud, of course, you saw, you need databases, you need uh, application uh, development frameworks, uh, you need a lot of things uh, for that. You need your own data, of course. And while we have already in, in, the, in our IBM Cloud some, some connected vehicle services, you have also the flexibility to developing your own such services. Um, the bottom part is also quite important, quite interesting from uh, from our perspective. So apart from the platform as a service, where you don't you, you don't start from scratch, you don't need to know the gory details of the servers and the IP addresses and everything, which is quite a lot of overhead if you want to reach the de development stage. Uh, we also have the offering in terms of infrastructure. Infrastructure now brings developers a bit more down as they have the need actually to know these details and control those. So um, and a clear use case for, for when you would need an infrastructure as a service is when you have the big data problem. The big data problem, you have all these recordings, 300, 500 megabits per second recorded in the vehicle. Uh, you might be able to uh, upload a, a subset of that with wireless communications, but uh, what we've seen in, in uh, the Cloud LSVA project was that that was not really feasible. The, the amount of data is 
increasing very rapidly to hundreds of terabytes, and that's becoming very expensive to transfer. Uh, but provided you somehow get the information to the cloud, then you could avail as in, in, in the infrastructure from, um, for example, GPUs, a farm of GPUs. You need to analyze your videos. How, how do you actually extract knowledge from videos? How do you go, as it was pointed out, back into history, learn from stuff that you have seen on the road? And this is, you can do, do that with uh, graphical processing units, GPUs. You can containerize your applications into Docker. You can uh, uh, use storage and such and so on. So what we're happy with these two projects uh, is mainly because we, we could be, we, we are in this consortia with OEMs, tier one, tier two suppliers, other uh, developers, and the key, the key point here is uh, data. Data is very critical. So unless you collaborate and can, or can collect your own data, uh, the business will become tough. Okay, so IBM's strategy in the auto industry is to provide solutions to OEMs and other market players to transform the way they develop applications and products, they conduct operations, and the way in which they interact with the retail customers. So core to our approach are cognitive solutions. So cognitive is the keyword here. That can be applied at the enterprise level for, for example, predictive maintenance. So in vehicle, for vehicle components through the life cycle that needs to involve multiple ecosystem participants. So you wanna, you wanna know before a component dies or a system dies that it, it needs replacement so you can proactively um, uh, do that. Um, also, retail experience that is evolving to include active consumer participation in the, in the development of mobility and assistive services. So that's the strategy. Now, the market demand is for solutions that help the industry address new and emerging business objectives. So what we hear from our customers is that they want solutions in these areas, so the ones you see on the screen, underpinned by the specific technologies or components. So most relevant uh, is the need to transform the development of cognitive components linked with the connected vehicles and continuous engineering. So basically, you would not start from scratch. There are some supportive applications. So we have the IoT4A offering. We have uh, Watson Personal Assistant, Commerce Platform, Security, Digital Twin, and um, Blockchain for the software-defined vehicle. So um, it's, a, it's a lot of offering that are already ongoing. However, the key question is, how do we as an industry collect and share data that is required for the safe and trusted deployment of such advanced driver assistance technologies? So that's the key question. How, how is the data, actually, the data owners and so on, how do they come together? How do they provide uh, added value to this? Uh, brief, brief examples of such data is, for example, um, historical data about the drivers, which allows the OEMs to understand how drivers are using new systems and how the introduction of cognitive assistance is enhancing our driving styles. So as I, as I said, the driver will still be for a long time in the driving seat. And there is also a need for reliable uh, real-time data from both in-vehicle data and from exterior sources, which are the lifeblood of others and the development of a digital twin that I mentioned earlier will provide a connected response in vehicle maintenance. So people will be aware of problems arriving, arising in their, in their vehicles. Now, let's have a look a bit more, more uh, from a research perspective and from, from a use case perspective. We like use, case, uh, use cases, don't we? So one of these use cases that I want to discuss about is um, the, this situation. So two cars basically are driving, and at some point we know because we see the high level, we, we see the map, we, we see that they will at some point um, end up in a very close proximity uh, where vehicle B, the red one, will have to perform a, a highway uh, merge. So basically they don't, they, they don't know about each other. The vehicle A is actually, a is actually in uh, level three of automation, so the driver might not even be aware of some some other car uh, will be 
uh, joining soon and they will be very close physically together. But what I want to I point out here is that through the, through the cloud actually these cars can already be informed of their common routes at some point. So they will be very well, very well, uh, very well aware of uh, this situation. So contacts can be exchanged. They, they, will, be, they will be ready for the, the situation. For example, they will also negotiate through the cloud the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication um, um, strategy and communication um, uh, details. So vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle is, is a wireless technology allowing cars basically to talk to each other directly. But would you, would you actually allow any car to talk to your car and use the information you are provided with in your decisions? You would if you would trust that car. So just m meeting a car on the road doesn't mean you can also trust it. Could be a hacker. They could be fake 10 cars around you. you. You could be tricked into doing a lot of decisions. Uh, or your system could be tricked into believing there's a lot of cars that actually don't exist. So there's a lot of uh, cybersecurity research done in this space. But what I want to point out with uh, solutions such as the cloud, actually you can push this security keys or whatever encrypted communication um, needs you might have to both vehicles. So when they actually can see each other, can actually sense each other wirelessly, they can actually trust each other and they can start negotiating the, the merge uh, in this scenario. So at some point, actually, car, B, car B's system say, oh, you, we are now on level two. I can take over. I, can, I know already negotiated with the other vehicle that is approaching, and I know how to take over and do actually the lateral movement and get into the lane and use the highway properly. So I think it's a very interesting use case. Um, not the question is when do we actually need a cloud? When do we need a vehicle to cloud communication? When do we need a vehicle to vehicle communication? So for that, I have another research looking diagram. So we looked at these use cases and realized each use case is basically unique in, in the way um, in, in the way communication uh, works for them. So we figured there, there are, there's at least two dimensions to this uh, uh, analysis done to use cases. So we call them the spatial, so the distance, and temporal, so time uh, dimensions. And the border between those vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to cloud uh, uh, areas basically define you have to look at the use case and basically kind of a pin, pin it in this map. Where, where does your use case fit? What kind of communication, what kind of context you need to share? So the area there is um, um, defined by three thresholds, actually. One threshold is, is on the distance axis. So basically, that's a, li that's, that's a system limitation from, from your vehicle in terms of how far can you reach other vehicles with wireless technology. Nowadays, V2V can reach a few hundred meters. I'm not aware of the details of the cellular V2V. Uh, could, you could be reaching more vehicles, but the further actually you reach, the less, import, the less critical is for safety critical applications. So you need to keep a bubble of, of space around you. So that would be the, the, the distance threshold. However, the other temporal thresholds, like threshold number two, is between the domain of now and the domain of the, of, of the past. So at some point, information will become useless for safety critical applications. It doesn't matter what happened three, se uh, three seconds ago. So at that point, basically, information becomes history. So it goes into the domain of the past. But that information is not useless completely unless you somehow use it. So you can use that sharing or storing it somewhere, but as the previous presenter mentioned, the, um, the usage of such data in a, collab in, a, in a community context. So you use the data from various drivers, not just one. Just do not focus, on, focus on, only on yourself, but also the other participants. So that's when the data becomes valuable, and those would be vehicle to cloud use cases. On the other hand, there's threshold number three, which is could be interesting is the threshold between the domain of the now and of the future. So how can that be, actually? But it's, it's true. Vehicles actually self 
driving vehicles and uh, automated system systems, actually they consume the sensor data and what they do is they project a lot of risks that can happen in the future. It's called a, a prediction horizon. How far, in, how far in the future can you simulate what is the biggest risk? Would, the, would a pedestrian jump in front of the car? Would a cyclist they take a turn and, and such? So there is a really small uh, interval of time that cars are actually capable of simulating these scenarios so they can actually already know what decisions they have to take such a scenario should arise. Um, I had an interesting conversation yesterday. Some companies actually set a threshold for 10 seconds um, to this prediction horizon, how, how, how far in the, in, the, in the future this communication can happen. So should you need to share this information with other vehicles, you might need to use vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communication. But then there is also the vehicle to cloud space even further away from, from this threshold number three. How is that even possible? There was a use case just uh, in the previous presentation. You drive along a, ro uh, a road and five minutes away from where you are now, there is a rough patch of uh, black ice, for example, or there is a congestion or something. You're not aware of that. You could, if you would be aware of that, you might take some actions change the road, or if your car is in level three automation, you don't want to let those systems drive you on a, on a skiddy road. So you want, you, want, you want to go back in control of your own vehicle. So again, the cloud could be that factor of providing you with information over the next minutes or hours. So this contextual information. OK, so let me sh just uh, summarize a bit the discussion and the, the capabilities with the, what's happening in the vehicle. It's called the local dynamic map. So this is how the environment is sensed, how this is how things are simulated in the future. I said there is a cap capability there for this information to be shared with the cloud. The way to do that, we figured, is the, uh, could actually fit. It's a very, very, very good use case for the IoT world, so in the Internet of Things, where uh, Small data can be uploaded, uploaded to the cloud. Then we can do all various sorts of applications, driver behavior, the global dynamic map, synchronizing basically the local dynamic maps of multiple vehicles. Uh, you see here the global dynamic map can actually support in creating bubbles of warnings, alerts, that when a new vehicle drives into, they will be aware of all the situations, black ice, traffic, and so on and so on. Also in the cloud, we have uh, capabilities. So we need graph uh, databases to create these complex dynamic maps. We need machine learning to learn from previous data uh, and extract knowledge and useful information. But also, as it was pointed out, third party services, weather. How did weather actually influence? We don't know the weather. The car doesn't tell you what the weather was like. But you could actually extract it from other services. The car could actually behave as a, as a weather node as well. Um, go, go, going towards the end of my presentation now, so um, this is a list of services and applications that the Global Dynamic Map basically is served with. Um, this was extracted based on the use cases that a lot of people in the consortium, in the VDAS consortium, came up with. So. We have applications like driver assessment, maneuver support, driving recommendations. So all this can be done on the data your car will upload. So it's, it, the consumer is mainly the driver here. So they, they will be consuming all this data. But these applications cannot work by themselves. You need to, call, to use some other services, such as location, the status of the driver at a particular point, the status of the other systems in the vehicle, alerts, so capabilities to sending alerts, geofencing, and also know, knowing the road conditions in various locations. So just to conclude, uh, going back now to the crossing between level two and level three, uh, just imagine if you would be, in order to be able to know whether the car can hand back the, the, hand back the control to the, to the driver, uh, you need to collect information about the driver's Awareness. So the, the easiest way to do that is actually to look at the driver's face. Can you measure anything there? Uh, if you would have this information, you would see the vision cone, so where the driver is actually looking and the eye gaze. 
So actually, technology is there. So with our partners in Vidas, we uh, reached the point uh, where uh, we can actually measure this eye gaze, head positioning, eye amplitude. So all this information is very, very uh, uh, useful and important. So here, here I, I, I did myself, a, of course, I wouldn't be a researcher unless I tested the technology on myself. So here I did a quick test on how this uh, technology actually works. So you see how the uh, eyes are tracked, the, the position of the eyes and the position of the head. And all this is actually streamed live to the, to the cloud. And we can also see the ground truth, like where actually I was driving, just to see the this is not a simulator the thing. So you can see in, in the map in the background that while I'm driving, you can see where my head is positioned. So typically a head, <laughs> preferably a head. And also where I was looking, so where the eye gaze was looking. Now, this information is useful for me at the end of the trip, for the systems to know if they can hand the control to me if I need to take over. But also, imagine for uh, road, road safety authorities. They would actually, if they would have access to this, to this data, they would say, oh, there is a junction which is particularly badly managed by drivers. So we have to have a look into that. So that's my last slide, and I hope you got some messages from our side. So thank you very much, and I'll be around for, if you have any questions. Thank you.